name is Hasina Amin, and I am the chairman of the Department of Children's Investment Communication, the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the United Nations. And I'm so pleased to be with you tonight and to have a chance to introduce our guest speaker for this special event, Ambassador Martin S. Enver. Uh, Ambassador Indik was, uh, is a Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. He previously served twice as the U.S. Ambassador to Israel in 1995-1997 and as a President, uh, as an Assistant Secretary of the State of Media Sectors and a Special Assistant to President Bill Clinton. Ambassador Indik was the Senior Director for the Near East and South Asia at the National Security Council. He also was the Founding Director of the Western Institute for Near Eastern Policy and of the Saipan Center for Near East Policy. His latest book is titled Innocent the Broad, an intimate account of the American peacemaking diplomacy in the Middle East. Book was well received globally and he's now working on his next book that is titled Bending History Barack Obama's Foreign Policy. The book will be published in March. His current research focuses on the American foreign policy as well as the Middle Eastern affairs. Ambassador Endai will speak to us tonight on the U.S. foreign policy. Finally, and if you don't know, I must say that he is just a, uh, he is just a, a wonderful person, uh, and uh, he has been visiting Egypt uh, many times before and attended some of his lectures. Uh, and I promise you that we are all in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Martin Henry. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, doing me the honor of having the opportunity to address you this evening. Uh, and through you to salute the uh, extraordinary courage of uh, the students of the American University of Cairo who played such an important leadership role in the revolution that took place uh, a year ago. Uh, this is my first time back in uh, Cairo since the revolution. Invited to have an opportunity to uh, learn and, and listen to the amazing uh, political debate that's going on here uh, about your future. Um, and uh, I spent a day in, in meetings with people across the spectrum, I'll be here for a couple more days, but um, it is truly an amazing contrast uh, with the last time I was uh, here in Egypt before the revolution. Um, the vibrancy of the uh, debate uh, is uh, truly uh, impressive and um, come away uh, completely confused as to what is happening and what is going to happen. So I hope that I will have the opportunity to learn a little more from you as well. I thought that uh, it might be useful uh, for me to uh, begin by giving you uh, a short analysis of uh, US policy towards uh, Egypt uh, and uh, create a context for what I believe uh, is its own revolution. Policy that was taking place uh, recently, and in particular, uh, 
prompted by the revolution in Egypt. And uh, the product is uh, now playing itself out. Indeed, perhaps uh, the most public expression uh, of it took place today uh, when the Deputy Secretary of State, the number two person in the State Department, Ambassador Bill Burns, met with the head of the Muslim Brotherhood today in Cairo. Um, to understand what a revolution that is, we need to go back a little bit in time. Um, before the revolution uh, in Egypt, the US policy uh, in the Middle East uh, had been amazingly stable for some five decades since World War II, regardless of who was president, Republican or, or Democrat. Essentially, uh, these presidents uh, approached the Middle East as a region of vital interest to in the United States um, and defined American interests. Uh, and I want to emphasize there was no never really any debate about this the presidents through five, six decades. He defined American interests essentially as, you won't be surprised to this, oil, 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 and Israel. Um, oil uh, was a vital American interest because so much of uh, the oil that fuels the industries uh, of the global economy today, and the Western economy during the Cold War, comes out of the Middle East. And uh, therefore, when the United States essentially took over from the United Kingdom as uh, the uh, protector and promoter of Western and then global interests. We had a vital interest in the free flow of the Middle East oil uh, to, to the global economy at reasonable prices. Uh, that was at heart of the interest that we sought to protect and promote. Uh, I say oil, oil, and oil because from that basic principle ensuring the free flow of oil at reasonable prices uh, came several other interests what related to oil. Ensuring the security and stability of the key oil producing states, especially Saudi Arabia, and uh, ensuring the stability of the broader uh, Middle East region from which the oil uh, would flow. And that's where Egypt came in um, because Egypt is the largest militarily the most powerful, politically most influential, culturally most influential uh, country in the world uh, with its geostrategic location it became the cornerstone of uh, American efforts to promote a broader framework of stability Uh, the fourth interest that I talked about was uh, Israel. And there you see, again, a bipartisan uh, commitment, uh, regardless of who was in the White House, uh, backed by a strong bipartisan commitment of Congress and strong and broad uh, public support, American public opinion, for the survival and well being of the Jewish state. And um, it's those uh, interests, in particular, the need to try to reconcile the tension between needing to have close and strong relations with our Arab allies, particularly Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and the need to ensure the survival security and well-being of the State of Israel, that produced 
what I call a derived interest in resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict in order to ensure stability, uh, but also to remove the tension between uh, needing to be friends with Arabs and Israelis uh, while they were in conflict. And so from 1967 on, Successive American presidents, Democrat or Republican, uh, have been devoted to trying to resolve the Arab Israeli conflict. And the most important uh, breakthrough in that regard uh, was the first treaty that the United States helped to negotiate, uh, which is the first in Egypt, Israel, the peace treaty. Uh, and that part of the structure of ensuring the stability of the region. Because with Egypt at peace with Israel, no other Arab country could contemplate making war on Israel. And that launched a, a, a long period since uh, 1978. Uh, of peacemaking diplomacy, of which I had the uh, opportunity not to be a part of the Clinton administration, which produced uh, the Madrid process, in which all of the Arab states, neighboring Israel and the Palestinians, engaged in direct negotiations with Israel for the sake of achieving a comprehensive peace. It produced the Oslo Accords for an Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace and the Israel-Jordan peace treaty. Indeed, after the uh, first Gulf War, and the eviction of Saddam Hussein's army from Kuwait and the collapse of the Soviet Union, Pax Americana, the effort to achieve a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace under American auspices became the uh, way in which the United States sought to ensure its dominance in the region and its, the protection of its interests. Throughout American history, there has always been an effort in one way or another to go beyond protecting America's interests national interests, to promoting America's values, the values in particular in, uh, as, as a democratic state. Um, and that uh, balance, striking that balance between democracy, promoting democracy, and promoting our interests, in particular the Middle East, promoting democracy versus promoting stability, um, that balance has shifted depending on the ideological preferences of the president at the time um, and the particular circumstances. In the Middle East, however, all American presidents since the Second World War chose to promote stability over democracy, chose to protect and promote our interests rather than our values. Um, and it became known as the Middle East exemption. Uh, in essence, to put it in crudely, uh, in shorthand, the United States was willing to enter a series of pacts uh, with any Arab leader that was willing to maintain stability and stand against uh, those powers in the region, and particularly during the Cold War backed by the Soviet Union, who sought to revise the status quo. Uh, the essential pact went like this. You support uh, stability and we'll leave you alone. 
to handle your own internal affairs. There was along the way some support for the building of civil society, for women's rights, uh, but essentially in the Middle East, successive American presidents put American interests ahead of American governments. George W. Bush was the exception to this rule, at least for a short period of time. Some of you will remember uh, his Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, uh, coming here in 2005 to give her own Cairo speech, in which she said, quote, for 60 years, my country, the United States, pursued stability at the expense of democracy in this region, here in the Middle East, and we achieved neither. Throughout the Middle East, the fear of free choices can no longer justify the denial of liberty. And so it was that George Bush, for one uh, bright moment, uh, decided to pursue a freedom agenda in the Middle East, in particular um, in Egypt, where he pressed Mubarak to open some political space for moderate and secular forces to emerge, and succeeded for a moment in persuading Mubarak to loosen his grip. You know this part of the story better than I do. But when Hamas won the Palestinian elections, which, by the way, George Bush insisted on taking place, uh, that was not what he had intended at all. And he relented and returned to his policy in the Middle East to its default position, which I've just been described. It's important to underscore when Hamas Essentially, a Muslim Brotherhood organization won the elections, Palestinian elections in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, we, the United States, under George W. Bush, dropped his freedom agenda and pulled back. Uh, refused to deal with Hamas. Um, and uh, uh, the rest, of course, is history. But I underscore it because it stands in stark contrast to what we've been in the last few months. Um, Barack Obama, when he became president, uh, was determined to distinguish himself from George W. Bush. And he made clear during his campaign as president that he would not promote democracy in the race. At least not the way that Bush did. He portrayed himself as a realist in the Eisenhower, Kennedy, Reagan, Bush 41 contribution, rather than an idealist in the Bush 43 mold. His visionary rhetoric, though, uh, rarely included the D word, democracy. Uh, many of you would have watched, perhaps some of you were in the audience, when he made his current speech. 2009, and uh, watch to see how he would handle Mubarak's increased suppression of the Egyptian opposition after Bush had backed off from President Bush. In that speech, Obama distanced himself from Bush by declaring that, quote, no system of government can or should be imposed by one nation on any other. While he vowed his support for human rights, he noted that there is no straight line to realize this promise. Um, and so it was in so many other aspects of uh, the policy that he promoted. Uh, he wanted to build civil society, he wanted to Sure that there were people to people exchanges, but he would not press our government uh, to open its political space and allow for greater freedoms. 
Um, all that changed of course around a year ago this month uh, when uh, the uh, revolution uh, began in Tunisia uh, spread across the Arab world in particular uh, down the road here in Tyrus. Now the United States President Obama faced a real dilemma. You, the people of Egypt, were demanding the very things that we hold dear as Americans. Uh, democracy, freedom of speech and assembly, uh, peaceful protest, accountable and transparent government, free and fair elections. Um, and the way in which you went out in peaceful mass demonstrations uh, against the Pharaoh, uh, who had denied him basic rights for decades, uh, created a circumstance in which essentially became impossible, notwithstanding everything I just outlined, it became impossible for. Uh, United States be against it. Um, and so Obama had to recalculate the balance between interests and values in a fast moving situation in which uh, turmoil and revolution were threatening the whole long power, not only of our Egyptian ally, Hosni Mubarak, who had been our uh, more or less faithful. Power 30 years, but um, threatening the whole of power of all of our key allies across uh, the region. Um, and as I said before, because of Egypt's regional weight and role in US strategy, what the President of the United States did here mattered more than what he did anywhere else. In the midst of these Arab awakenings. Um, so, when the demonstrations here in Tahrir Square grew to the hundreds of thousands, uh, Obama had to make a quick decision. Will he stand with the demonstrators or will he stand against them? Um, I'm not sure how much of, of what he did in those days is familiar to you. I suspect that you followed it quite closely. But I don't know whether uh, you know that um, at a critical moment in the early days of, of the demonstrations, uh, he issued a uh, clear a warning to the Egyptian military that they should not fire on the demonstrators and that if they did, uh, they would be jeopardizing uh, American military assistance. Uh, in fact, there's uh, legislation that requires the cutoff of American military assistance to any military that uses American weapons against its own people. And that uh, warning, even threat, was conveyed very clearly to the uh, Egyptian generals uh, through a variety of uh, channels, very direct. And it was done publicly. Uh, it wasn't the only reason that the Egyptian military issue in their first communication said they would not fire on the demonstrators. But I believe it was a very significant part of their calculation. Um, and that was the first step he took to make clear that uh, he would oppose the use of force to suppress peaceful. Um, he went one step further 
at that point, he had decided that um, American interests were the best served by ensuring that there was an orderly transition. Um, some of you may recall the use of that, those words by the President and Secretary of State. Uh, but as the demonstrations grew, and Mubarak uh, resisted the idea that he should step aside, and the President came out in very clear terms, uh, calling on him to leave office, and to do it now. And just in case he didn't hear the message, the President's spokesman came out and said, now means yesterday. Um, that uh, sent a signal to our other allies in the region, uh, particularly uh, the Saudi king and the other uh, sheikhs of Arabia in the Gulf, uh, that was particularly disturbing. Uh, for if, you, if the President of the United States could abandon uh, his longtime Egyptian ally, uh, in the face of only a few days of albeit mass demonstrations, and if he could do so in such a humiliating way, they wondered what would he do to them if they faced a similar circumstances. Uh, but notwithstanding some very angry phone calls, uh, he spoke to his guns, um, believing that it was essential for the United States to get on the right side of history, the side of the people against the Pharaoh. Um, he could have chosen differently. And I'm not sure whether that's really appreciated. Um, but if you want to see how he could have acted differently, Take a look at what he did in the case of Bahrain, where the uh, government of Bahrain moved against one fifth of its population who were out in the streets of the Pearl Square uh, with the military support of Saudi Arabia and the GCC, and the president urged them to exercise. Um, to be sure, Bahrain, bordering on Saudi Arabia, the largest, uh, that, at that time, the largest producer of oil in the world, and the only swing producer with the capacity to increase production and therefore moderate the uh, rise in the price of oil as a result of all this instability in the region. Um, the circumstances were quite different, and the concern about protecting the free flow of oil at reasonable prices very clearly trumped um, the president's feeling that he needed to be on the right side of history. It didn't extend to the, uh, the citizens of Bahrain who were engaged in peaceful protest against their king. Um, but in Egypt, it was a different story. I think the president made a calculation that it was essential that Mubarak go and that the military be preserved uh, above the flag as the hoped for midwife to a stable democratic transition. Um, and when the military last December played a different role, opened fire on demonstrations, President Obama, true to this uh, approach, stood up and uh, condemned them and insisted, to the extent that he could insist, that they uh, hand over power to the civilian 
government. I don't know whether any of you noticed that statement, but there was a very there were two important words. One was that they do so expeditiously. You remember that the military at that point was talking about handing over power sometime in 2013. And that the handover to civilian government be inclusive. What does inclusive mean? Inclusive in the American diplomatic uh, lexicon means including those uh, uh, forces uh, in Egyptian uh, political life that represented the Islamist trend. That is to say, the Muslim Brotherhood. I have to say that at that point, it was three days before the elections, and I don't think Washington had been aware of the potential for the Salafist behind the major political force. But certainly, there was an expectation of the Muslim Brotherhood will do very well, and um, the use of the word inclusive was a way of signaling that the United States was in the process of changing its approach towards uh, dealing with Islamist political forces um, in Egypt. Um, when those democratic elections produced a massive victory for United States, again, the president had to sign. Does he work with them or against them? Um, there was a choice. Uh, the United States could have stood back and supported uh, the military in uh, a different course of action. But instead, uh, Obama has made clear that he intends to engage with the Islamists, that he recognizes uh, that the Egyptian people have spoken, uh, at least for the time being, uh, and that uh, he should, in the process of engaging with the Islamists, try to shape their responses, try to help them focus um, what we imagine the people of Egypt want, jobs, clean, transparent and accountable government, respect for minority rights, and the democratic rules of the government. Um, for American policy and strategy, it is a gamble uh, that democratic transformation in Egypt and American interests in stability in the Arab world are compatible rather than contradictory. Um, and to understand what a revolution that is in American policy, we have to understand what I'm saying is that we saw them as completely incompatible for the last 60 years. Um, it's a gamble that as Islamists take responsibility for governing this country, they will choose to feed people, give them what they want, rather than pursue an ideological agenda that might be at odds with the achievement of the stability of Egypt that can bring foreign tourists, foreign capital back to the country. Um, and it leaves a big question mark for U.S. policy, whether in fact American interests and the interests in particular of the Muslim Brotherhood are compatible. I do not speak for the U.S. government by any means, but I would impute from their approach that essentially their concerns in this engagement uh, relate specifically to uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood's approach to democracy. Uh, will they respect uh, the people's will 
not just when they win the election, but should they lose the next election, will it be another election that will be free and fair like this one? Will they respect human rights, women's rights, and perhaps, uh, very importantly, minority rights? Majority rules for the minority rights need to be respected and respected in a vibrant democracy. Will they seek stability or will they seek to revise the status quo in a way that creates uh, instability? Um, as I said, the, the, the hope is that um, they will have an abiding interest in uh, stability because that is the best way to achieve what the Egyptian people uh, seem to want. And finally, will they keep their commitments? Uh, the commitments that the Egyptian government has entered into uh, in terms of foreign obligations and treaties, including the Egypt-Israel peace treaty. Um, so that's essentially uh, how far American policy has come in a very short time to a point today where we see the potential for a very new approach to Egypt's uh, emerging democracy uh, on the part of the United States. Uh, and for the sake of Egypt's democracy and America's democracy, I hope very much that the new approach succeeds. Thank you. في صدفة غريبة جمعت أمريكا الحلفاء التقليديين مع العرب اللي هم دول الخليج مع مؤسسة بريتن وودز لأن بعد الثورة الكبراوي بعد بعد الثورة المطلقة الثورة المصرية بكبراوي شهرين لقينا إن في إجماع إن مثلا أمريكا والدول الغربية هتدعم مصر وتونس بحوالي 30 مليار دولار وفي نفس الوقت العرب وعد ب 10 مليار دولار في نفس الوقت المؤسسة بريتن وودز وعد هتقدم دعم اقتصاد مصر والدول الربيع العربي بفائده منخفضه. بعد الثوره بعام لان برضه نفس الاجماع ان امريكا ما قدمتش تقريبا حاجه من الوعد بيه لان مؤسسات بريتنز تراجعت عن عرضها وابتدت تفرض شروط مجحفه على الاقتصاد المصري ومضره الاقتصاد المصري اذا هي اقرت الاقتصاد المصري لان حتى الدول العربيه الخليجيه ارجعت دعمها للاقتصاد المصري وجنيته فترة العين الاستبداد ومش فاهم يعني ايه استبداد الاقتصاد. الحاجة الثانية ان في نفس الوقت على الجانب الاخر بنلاقي نفس الدول الغربية بتوجه دعمها لمنظمات المجتمع المدني بمليارات والدول العربية ايضا بتوجه دعمها للمنظمات الدينية الجمعيات الدينية في مصر بمليارات فأنا شايف ان ان السياسة المعلنة بالدعم غير الدولة المصرية غير غير اللي بتطبق أنا عاوز أفسر أعرف إيه التفسير اللي بيحصل شكرا
part of the explanation uh, lies in, in uh, Europe's preoccupation with its own economic crisis. Uh, it's been hard to fulfill commitments uh, at a time when you know, banks are uh, teetering in, in some of the countries in the Eurozone uh, have potential to uh, collapse. Um, part of the explanation uh, lies in United States own uh, difficult economic circumstances, where uh, and, and the political uh, battle in Washington, uh, in which um, foreign assistance is uh, highly unpopular, and uh, the chances for the uh, administration to get the Republican control of Congress. To, take on uh, new large commitments that does not exist. Uh, and that's just that's not just for Egypt, that's for the American people as well. Um, and uh, part of the explanation I think lies in in um, just the reality that uh, the Palestinian Authority can certainly speak to which is that uh, the Gulf states are very good at making promises, but, but very slow in, in fulfilling them. Um, and and uh, I think that that probably will continue to be the case for Egypt, as, by the way, was um, during uh, Sadat's time and Mubarak's time as well. So it's like they're discriminating there. They're just not very happy to take on the responsibility of, as it were, bailing Egypt out. Egypt is a very big country with very large needs. Prepared to do it for Palestine. Um, there can be more of that to do it for Egypt. But having said all of that, um, from the point of view of the United States, as I explained, we have a deep uh, interest in ensuring uh, the recovery of the Egyptian economy. And uh, I think there's a very strong commitment and to do whatever we can to, to help in that regard. Whether it is uh, encouraging American corporations to come back and invest here, uh, to uh, do our best to encourage a, a, a good agreement with the IMF, give you a, an emergency facility, uh, uh, finding all manner of creative ways, particularly with this debt swap that's been negotiated now, uh, to uh, help your government um, get the economy back on track. Uh, because I think yeah, it's entirely consistent with our interest in stability and in promoting our values and seeing that Egyptian democracy uh, actually flourishes. So we have, we have uh, two reasons to want to see uh, the uh, uh, Egyptian democratic experiment succeed, and the most critical uh, test of its success will be whether uh, a democratically elected government can uh, deliver on the basic needs of the Egyptian people uh, when it comes to jobs and housing. And, uh, Improve living conditions. So I think that, that uh, as long as the Egyptian government makes those things a priority, the U.S. government will, and the U.S. Congress will be doing what, what they can to help support that. How is this used from Washington? 
And on the other side of this, on the flip side also, in this, in your presentation, you very much focused on the U.S.-Egyptian relationship. Uh, you didn't mention um, uh, the kind of tensions we're beginning to see in this, and, uh, and the degree of rationality and the degree of uh, rationality in managing these kind of tensions. And also whether the U.S. in its approach is willing not only to do a revolution in terms of dealing with political Islam and, and U.S. values, but also to look at the linkages with the Palestinian issue. We, we don't see a, you know, a lot of willingness to, to take another look at that fact. I'm sorry, it's a complex question, but I'm trying to expand it. I'm just trying to expand the, the, the areas we've been talking about. Thank you, Judge. All right, I think, uh, yes, please, the lady over there. We need to make a balance. Sorry. We, yeah, that's right. Yes, indeed. Yes, two for one until now. So, <laughs> uh, I'm Jelena Alama, and I'm ambassador, um, and I'm from the Foreign, Foreign Council of Foreign Affairs. Um, Dr. Indik, um, I, I think uh, the United States now is taking a, um, a posture of a pragmatic diplomacy. I mean, until uh, February, early February, I think uh, the U.S. administration was supporting still, uh, supporting uh, you know half-heartedly President, uh, former President Mubarak in uh, his uh, uh, situation, and then when the revolution really materialized. Uh, we see a change of heart, and uh, we go ahead and uh, we change that. So I think it's a pragmatic approach the uh, U.S. diplomacy uh, administration is taking towards Egypt. Uh, now, um, dealing with uh, Muslim Brotherhood and uh, seeing that it seeks stability in Egypt, um, what kind? What is stability from the uh, standpoint of the United States? Egypt, what does it represent? What does it mean? On the other hand, I see some kind of a uh, double standard in dealing with political Islam. So Hamas came in Gaza with elections, with overwhelming elections, and yet the United States uh, puts it under its terrorist list. So uh, I think we should, uh, um, I think we need a, a clarification. And then the issue of Israel. Why is just Israel left out uh, from uh, the leaves as statement unfinished uh, when it comes to dealing with Egypt knowing its history with the issue. Thank you. Will I get to a two, please? I totally agree with what you said about President Bush being the exception in choosing uh, democracy over stability because I was with Mubarak when he visited President Bush at Crawford Ranch and there was an article in the Washington Post that said it was titled Our Man in Cairo and it said that Mubarak was the thorn in America's side to democracy in the Middle East and I could almost see President Bush wag his finger at Mubarak reform or else but then Secretary of State then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice visited Egypt some years later and I asked her what the US would do about um, the jailing of Ayman Moore and she said it was an internal matter and that the US would not meddle in Egypt's affairs. So we saw the turnabout. My question is, you, you said that uh, the Obama administration had told the military that they would be jeopardizing uh, American military aid if they fired at peaceful protesters. But then the violations continued um, and, and the Obama administration only condemned these violations. Do you think that the US would be prepared to use military aid as a pressure card? Excellent. Thank you very much. This is the first week of questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, the question of how does uh, the United States uh, view the rise of, of Islamic governments uh, across the region? Um, and I would say that um, it views it um, not as a threat, necessarily as a threat to our interests, which is something new. Um, but 
rather as an expression of, of the uh, uh, democratically expressed wishes of, of the people. Uh, and uh, therefore, as I say, you don't try to work with it. It may not work. Uh, but uh, the, the alternative, um, there is no real alternative. In the context of free and fair democratic elections across the whole region, starting here in Egypt, um, you know, it, uh, the context has changed quite dramatically. Um, and here I'll come back to come to the question about Hamas and the question of double standards. Um, I think what's the difference? Uh, I see it twofold. Um, one, the context was very different. It was not the Arab awakenings across the whole region and demand for democracy across the whole region. Um, it was a, 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 an election that the United States insisted upon. I uh, never imagined that it was. This, but the second thing is in contrast to the Muslim Brotherhood here. What's the contrast? The Muslim Brotherhood, I think it was in the 1970s, uh, you would know better than me, renounced violence as a, as a, a means for achieving that. Uh, Hamas continues to this day to espouse violence, armed struggle, terrorism, as a means to achieve its objective, which is uh, destruction of the state of Israel. Um, secondly, the Muslim Brotherhood has made clear, as recently as uh, two days ago, uh, with uh, Mr. Alvarez's uh, interview with the New York Times, in which he said that the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty is a commitment of the state and the Muslim Brotherhood respects that commitment. Whereas Hamas rejects the uh, Oslo Accords that were freely entered into by the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization on behalf of the Palestinian people, by Yasser and so it's not a double standard in that sense. It's actually quite consistent. What's different is that uh, there is a willingness now to accept uh, the, the verdict of the people of Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, whereas then uh, there was a, a, a like to say, refusal to do so. But it was tied up with those other factors. And indeed, the United States and the West said that if Hamas is prepared to announce violence, accept Israel's right to exist, and, and previous agreements entered into, then the United States will recognize Hamas. Uh, the uh, uh, question of what does stability uh, mean, uh, you know, I, I thought that I to find it, but I'll try again. It is a, uh, a focus on pursuing policies that will promote uh, the well-being of the Egyptian people and therefore help to stabilize the situation by meeting their needs. That's what stability means in this context. In the regional context, it means um, respecting peace treaties uh, entered into by uh, the state of Egypt. Um, and, and let's not forget that the result of that negotiation was a trade of territory for peace. That the United States negotiated uh, the return of every inch, every inch of, of Egyptian territory that was occupied in Israel as a result of the United States occupied by Israel as a result of the 1967 war. Um, so Israel fulfilled its obligations under that treaty. Um, I've seen the Muslim Brotherhood uh, talk about renegotiating the treaty. Um, and you know, if that's what it is that they uh, ultimately intend uh, to do, well, that's a negotiation with Israel. 
student in Israel will have some demands as well. Um, but uh, that's in the context of respecting the treaty that was in uh, So, you know, if, if uh, a democratically elected government in Egypt chose to pursue war rather than peace, I think that would be regarded by the United States as promoting its ability by definition. Um, inherent in the uh, relationship uh, of the United States providing uh, 1.3 billion dollars in military assistance uh, to Egypt uh, is uh, a relationship of dependence. The United States has over 30 years uh, trained, equipped, and for the most part paid for uh, the Egyptian armed forces. Uh, that relationship is a, a very strong one, uh, and it's a valuable one. I think it's fair to say to the Egyptian military that it's valuable to the United States. We have a long history of Egyptian dependence on, on the United States. Indeed, Egyptian dependence on foreign assistance from many countries over time. Uh, it's in the nature of Egypt's geostrategic position that it has the ability to leverage assistance from other countries because of its importance in the region. Um, there's also a history of incredibly um, prickly responses by Egyptian governments to the idea that aid should come with any strings attached. Um, it is a uh, function, I guess, of Egyptian pride. Um, and so uh, there's a long way of saying it's a very delicate matter. Um, but uh, at a critical moment, uh, as I said, uh, President Obama was willing to use the threat suspending military assistance in order to prevent the Egyptian military from firing the um, And uh, inherent in the condemnation that came in December, uh, I don't know whether a, 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 another threat was issued, but it's inherent in the condemnation um, and the US war that, um, that the military opens fire on the people. They are, they are as a matter of fact, jeopardizing the military assistance relationship with the United States. أنا لما أنتخب الإخوان أنا ربما انتخبت الليبراليين أو اليساريين 
وانا منتخب الاخوان لكني بعتبرهم قوه سياسيه في مصر الشرعيه وليها وجود واقبالها وهم ايضا بيقبلوا القوة الاخرى. لو افترضنا ان في قوه سياسيه قررت انها تجعل الشعب المصري يعلن رايه من خلال الاستفتاء في هذه الاتفاقيه. سواء الاستمرار فيها او تغيير كثير من دولتها. ونفترض ان الاخوان او قبلوا او رفضوا. هل هل ستعتبر الولايات المتحده الامريكيه اراده الشعب المصري واراده القوى السياسيه دهيا تدعو الى عدم الاستقرار؟ خصوصا وانك وضحت انه لو الاسرائيليين لهم موقف من هذه الاتفاقيه ورفضوا وضح 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 يا استاذ عشان بس خليني اقول سؤال انا بغيت يعني انا بتصل على سؤال ايز ليميت يعني يو بارت تو يور كويشن ثانك يو اي ام سين كوبايل ام جيرناليست My first question for you is, as far as I understood from you, that the uh, American government put some pressures on the SCAF. From your knowledge or to your knowledge, do, have they shown any signs that they wanted to stay in power and to delay or never transfer power to a civilian state? That question is the one. Number two, have you, right. you seem very reassured and the comfortable after your talk with the Muslim Brotherhood and their party. Is this because of what you have heard recently or because of your background and your knowledge with them? And that is me, that you will you feel comfortable. Two questions. All right, okay. It's, it's the same question. Yes, sir. All right. Let me get the question, please. Uh, we have uh, so many questions, so please just answer them as هناك مشاورات حاليا تتم بين القوى السياسية والمؤسسة العسكرية حول الرئيس المصري قاضي رئيس المنتخب هل تعتقد ان ان الولايات المتحده في اطار المشاورات التي تجرى حاليا بين القوى السياسيه وخاصه الاخوان تلعب دورا في في تلك التفاهمات او في تلك الحوارات وماذا تنتظرون من الصوره الخريطه بعد فوز الاخوان؟ شكرا.
Thank you all. Uh, uh, the, the first question was, I think, um, to paraphrase it, and, uh, the question um, was um, if there is a referendum in Egypt on the Egypt Israel Peace Treaty, will the United States respect the results of that the referendum? That's a part of your question. Um, yes? So, um, look, the, uh, the, the wonderful thing about democracy is you get to take your fate into your own hands. Um, and if you decide in your wisdom that you want to have a referendum that would abrogate the Egypt Israel Peace Treaty, I just hope you will also take into account um, the potential consequences of um, such a thing. Um, Probably there are few people here that remember what it was like in Egypt when Egypt uh, was at war with Israel. But it caused immense suffering for the Egyptian people. Um, and those who have a memory of that should, should speak up. Um, what exactly would be achieved by abrogating your international commitments? You see, it's not, you said it was a question of you not having a vote at the time, that Sadat made a, made a decision to make peace, um, but he wasn't a democratically elected president. Well, in the affairs of state, in relations between states, if governments do not fulfill the commitments of, of governments uh, that, uh, that previous governments made, and freely entered into, um, then it puts a question mark over the reliability of any commitments made, uh, in particular in this case by Egypt. After all, was there some abrogation of commitments on the part of Israel that would justify abrogating the peace treaty? Is there some, something that uh, was done, or just because you don't like? Uh, having peace with Israel. Well, think about the alternatives before you uh, decide that you want to go headlong into this process. And think also about a, a simple reality, which is that you will not have the United States helping you uh, in any respect uh, if you decide to abrogate that, that peace treaty. Uh, so I think this needs a, a rational calculation, um, and it's particularly interesting to me that in all of the discussions that I've had here, um, I don't bring this subject up, but all of the interlocutors do, and they all say we are not going to touch the Egypt Israel Peace Treaty. This is, you know, us, including the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and they volunteer. So, uh, in the press, on the front page of the New York Times, and repeat it, as do the Salafis. So, um, uh, you know, I think that, that uh, those who now are looking to uh, exercise responsibility and understand uh, just what I think is a basic reality, there's nothing for me to say, which is that it's in Egypt's interest to abide by its treaty commitments. Um, there was a question about whether uh, I thought that uh, uh, Scaff wanted to delay the handover of uh, power. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, no, I'm not in a good position to judge them. I think that they've set a timetable uh, for um, the uh, constitution, for the, uh, for the revision of the constitution, for the referendum, and the presidential elections. June 30th of this year, it's a very short time, uh, and, and rather than my expressing opinion, I would say let's, let's wait and see. Um, but uh, I think everybody uh, that's involved in the political process seems to be operating on the assumption that um, this timetable is, is, is a real timetable. Uh, uh, I think I was asked about. Most of my conversations I seem to be 
the short red line was about the death. I haven't yet had a conversation with Mr. Fowler about it. I would simply say that uh, it's not, because I haven't spoken to them, I can't make a joke. It's not about what they say that matters. It's about, I think, the circumstances in which they find themselves. They will have to make a choice if they're going to come. Then they're going to have to decide uh, what is the priority. And is it their ideology? Or is it um, a pragmatic approach to meeting the needs of the people who put them in office? And, um, we'll see. But so far, the indications are that, that they uh, are approaching it. There was a question about uh, uh, the role of the president and uh, what would happen uh, once he is elected. Um, you know, I, again, I, I think that, that there's, there's a lot of questions like that that simply don't have answers. Um, the uh, powers of the presidency as opposed to the powers of the legislature will have to be defined. Um, and uh, until that occurs, uh, it's very hard to know exactly what will happen once uh, a president is, is elected. Um, clearly some decisions, some fateful decisions will have to be made about the kind of system, democratic system in Egypt is going to have. Um, and I, I, uh, I would only say that because they are faithful decisions, they need to be discussed and debated openly and, and by experts, people who are far more expert in designing political systems than me, who are far more knowledgeable about um, the virtues and, and the pitfalls of a variety of systems, whether it's the French system uh, that seems to gain currency here as, as the model that you want to follow, uh, or the, the British Westminster model. I don't think anybody's considering the American model. Uh, I would recommend it myself. Uh, but I do think it's very important uh, that, that this be handled, uh, even though it's under pressure of a short timetable, be handled in a, in a uh, open and serious way because of the powers of the presidency versus the powers of the legislature will have a big impact on the way in which business is done here. Um, uh, the point about uh, separation of religion and state is a very good one. Of course, uh, in the United States, we have a very strong principle that uh, there should be a separation of religion and state. Um, and indeed, no funds can be used uh, for the purposes of you know, no government funds, taxpayers' funds. States uh, recognizes that uh, Islamic democracy is going to be different and that uh, people of Egypt in this particular case are going to have to work out their own uh, principles and their own uh, uh, question of what is the appropriate role for religion in government affairs. Um, we have a very clear view for ourselves but, but, uh, and we would recommend it. But that's, that's up, up to people in Egypt and how they resolve that tension. And there is a tension between the will of God and the will of the people. Uh, is something that is going to have to be worked out in, in these coming days. Uh, and and uh, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of new and, and brave world. And we'll see. We've seen, we've seen in the case of Iran how badly that can go wrong. So uh, I hope you won't be faced with that kind of condition. Uh, I think I covered it. There was a question about Egypt, about Condition A. Um, and I didn't quite catch the question, so could, could I ask you to repeat it again? Uh, my question was uh, concerning the U.S. 
expect in Egypt to say no for a condition of aid, um, and we don't know how the USA uh, could play with the uh, aid card as a pressure on the uh, military council. And then I wonder if the USA is really uh, serious about promoting democracy here in Egypt. And, um, for okay. <laughs> Look, I tried to answer it um, before, and I'll, I'll try again. Um, in, in the experience the United States has in um, providing assistance, uh, we have found over, over many decades that putting conditions on aid is usually counterproductive. Uh, and so you know, there's a sensitivity to that. We're giving assistance because we believe in the value of that assistance uh, in itself. Uh, and so using it as a kind of uh, lever to produce a change in behavior is not a, a productive uh, way in, in our own judgment of the time. Um, and in the particular case of Egypt, as I said before, there's, a, there's an extreme sensitivity to the idea that aid should be conditioned. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, you know, I don't know how many of you know about the history of when the United States uh, was engaged in Tamalot and Nasa, and uh, uh, he felt that, was, that we were putting some conditions on aid and said, go and drink, drink the uh, sea. Yeah, and sent us to hell. And, uh, <laughs> um, if the sea's not enough, go and drink the water from the dam. I think this is um, so, so, this issue is, is a sensitive one. But um, I think it's important that you know, there are certain. There are certain <coughs> basic assumptions about the way each side is going to behave in a relationship. And there are certain realities. Uh, as I said, it's a matter of US law that, that the administration is required to cut off assistance, suspend assistance, military assistance, if the weapons are used on uh, the recipient countries' own people. Over the farm of their own people, that crosses a definite red line. It's all of the conditions, you know, uh, but it's just a reality. And the same will apply in the case of the ancient Israel history. The massive amount of assistance that the United States has provided in Egypt began with the signing of the Egypt history and has continued ever since. Uh, in part because of the maintenance of the Egypt history. And so there's a basic reality. If the people of, of Egypt in their wisdom decide to abrogate the peace treaty, uh, I think the Congress will the next day, won't, there won't be a condition, but the Congress will the next day cut, cut off the assistance. Then the American taxpayer is not going to support the Egyptian. Egyptian decision to break a treaty commitment uh, solemnly entered into by the Egyptian state. Uh, the US taxpayer is going to subsidize that kind of uh, behavior. It's just a reality. It's not a threat, it's just a reality. Okay, uh, we're going to have uh, another way because we are like, I said 15 minutes and now it's an hour. And I see like uh, the hands are already increasing, not decreasing. So uh, today is Thursday and we would like to go over so that we that they also get tested because he has a full day to be really came up already having uh, incredible meetings everywhere all over them. So uh, just uh, have some uh, questions, please have you find yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Give him the microphone. Thank you. Uh, um, you made the distinction to ascribe American <coughs> of 
the change in American foreign policy between uh, promoting the values and pursuing interests. However, I think one may see uh, a big uh, problem in the relationship just in the way both uh, aims are pursued. Um, meaning, do you see maybe even contradictory, uh, self-contradictory uh, means to, to fulfill? Namely, one that the United States themselves uh, don't feel um, subject to international law, that they they should just accept it as a. Um, uh, however, and the second one is that the strategy is still the same strategy. That the strategy of having one man, which is contradictory to um, the democratic value themselves, also in terms of development aid. And Thank you. Over here, please. Yes, you too. Um, you spoke about a Mideast exception within the uh, U.S. foreign policy establishment for, for decades. Um, now that's changed, I wonder... Excuse me. We, we cannot really hear the question. We just uh, give them a chance to put the question for us. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if that, uh, now that exception is changing, if we'll see maybe a formulation of what you could term a Saudi exception or an exception for the U.S. oil producing states, or will U.S. posture um, sort of never really change uh, vis a vis those states? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Please. Um, it's a remark rather than a question. Uh, I think that nothing has changed after the revolution, and in the, the interest of the states will be oil, oil, oil. And this is uh, apparent and it's relevant. It's, it's apparent. To what happened to Libya, what happened in the south of Sudan, and what's happening in Syria. And in Syria, the dictator is still there, and no one interfered, and no one cared to interfere because of the war. And the second, uh, my second remark is, uh, um, I'm really surprised that you say that the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, gave the military, uh, uh, no, no, no. And ask the military not to interfere and not to shoot the people. And uh, um, I'm really surprised about this because you are, you are insinuating that the military was not beside the revolution while it was beside the revolution from the first day and they could have shot the people from the first day while the US was not beside the revolution nor declared its position except after a couple of weeks. Okay, so how this is clear. So I'm, I'm surprised. Right. When did, when did this happen? Okay, good, Steve. Thank you. Please, sir. Yes. <laughs> Questions, please. Uh, Mike Troy, I'm American. I'd like to give you a uh, an American blue-collar worker point of view on uh, foreign policy. And um, one of the, uh, back when I started studying, it was back after the, the Sinai War, and I always figured that the U.S. foreign policy and, and maybe foreign aid is a different thing. Okay, two different things, possibly, I don't know. Um, but I always figured Egypt got paid off not to attack Israel. And at, at the time, when I was paying attention, Egypt, or Israel was getting about 80 million, uh, Egypt was getting about 50 million. Okay, and a two to one ratio that's, I don't know if that's still in existence. And uh, my biggest question is if military aid, foreign aid, um, foreign policy goes to the military, can there be any real peace? Thank you. Uh, we, uh, yes, uh, over here, yes, thank you. Thanks, so. Sen Dozhi from the Faculty Forum for Democracy Studies and Media Region. My question is, uh, further going to you, Mr. Martin, uh, what about your analysis toward the crackdown against NGOs in Egypt, um, and what, um, and to what extent this action in the, 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 the democratic transition in Egypt? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the this is. Uh, I mean, sorry. Yes. Now, seriously, thank you. Uh, 
You know, in the in the um, establishment of the balance between American interests and values, a lot of factors are very in play. Uh, the Middle East uh, exceptionalism that I described, in fact, the Arab world, the exceptionalism that I described was was a kind of extreme version of the way in which we balanced uh, interests and values. You see, it's very different. Essentially, the rest of the world. Uh, and, and there are a lot of factors that go into that calculation, including upholding of international law uh, and, and as a value for the United States in terms of the promotion of, of, of order in the world. Uh, and that, there is a value that, that also happens to serve our interests. So, in a sense, I've drawn a dichotomy that, that can be um, misleading because it suggests that pursuing values is not in our interests. Because it's just the interests uh, for their pure value. Um, so, it's, it's a um, so in a sense, it's a false dichotomy. It is in our interest to pursue our values. It just so happens that in the Middle East, we judge that it wasn't in our interest to pursue our values. Now, somebody, I think you want to say something about uh, the Saudi, would there be a, yes, you uh, asked about, would there be a Saudi exemption? Now, and in some ways, what happened in Bahrain uh, says the answer is yes. In that case, the president made a decision that our interests in the free flow of oil at reasonable prices trump uh, our uh, interest in supporting uh, the demand, peaceful demand for uh, greater political freedom and representation in Bahrain. Uh, but if we turn that into Call the kind of GCC exemption, or uh, actually what the Saudis want is a is a monarchical exemption. Uh, uh, it's okay for the public to do whatever you want in the Republic of Egypt, uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, Libya, Yemen, Libya. Uh, this, but stay away from the, the, the sheikhs and kings. We're different. We have great legitimacy. Uh, tribal reasons or religious reasons. Uh, we want to be enlightened, take care of our people, basically, and make sure we do so. Well, uh, so don't stay out of our affairs, essentially, what the Saudis are saying. And they don't like the fact that the King of Morocco has embarked on constitutional reforms that basically put Morocco on the road towards constitutional monarchy. They don't like that the King of Jordan is talking about doing the same thing in the Sultan of Oman. Uh, and they're basically offering you know, membership of $20 million to go along with the GCC for these other kings, saying basically, you come into, if you come into our family here where it will be an exemption, uh, I think it would be a, a, a mistake in terms of US interests, not just in that, for us to buy into that uh, new exemption. Because I think it's essential that if, if we learn anything from what's happened in this last year, particularly if we just have across the region, it is that the failure to embark on serious political reforms that allows the people Freedom of expression allows civil society to grow, allows for free and fair elections to empower legislature. Failure to, to pursue that course uh, on the part of the monarchies, not just Republicans, is going to have a bad end. And that they all need to get on the road to constitutional monarchies. It may take time. There may be different uh, paces of reform, uh, less than uh, serious reform, that are 
the Saudi Arabia in particular against women in regard, they will find themselves in the same situation sooner or later as Hosni Mubarak faces. The oil issue, I know there's a lot of emotions about this, but I think it's important to stick to certain facts. The United States had no particular interest in Libya oil. No particular Britain and France. And that's why the United States focused on values rather than its interests. We have basically now zero interest in Libya. This is not an issue from the point of view of the United States. For us, it's not an immaterial issue. Many barrels a day, you know, maybe important to Britain and France or Italy or something. It's immaterial to us, as Saudis. Bumped up the production when the Libyan oil uh, uh, was taken out of the market. I mean, the price of oil jumped to 120, went down again below 100. It didn't affect our interests. And what Obama focused on there was the value of protecting innocent civilians, the responsibility to protect them. And that's why we did it. In the case of Syria, again, it was oil. Syria is not an important oil producer, but Syria did export its oil to Europe. And we pressed Europe to impose sanctions on the Assad regime so as to prevent the export of its oil to Europe. And that has had a significant impact on, on uh, the regime's ability uh, to survive in the Excuse me, would you please, would you please, would you please say your words, would you please, would you please listen to me? Would you please just respect the rules that governs this court? Would you please listen to me? There's no, would you please listen to me? Would you please listen to me? I mean, you can, we can wait for the minister until he finishes work and then, and then, would you please listen to me? Would you please? Maybe we should discuss it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, the other question you asked was about um, the, the military was beside the revolution from the early days and the trial was, uh, was late in coming to support the revolution. Uh, I'm specifically talking about those early days. I'm specifically talking about the days before the Egyptian military issued its first communicator in which it recognized the demands of people as a general and announced that it would not fire the people. The warnings that came from the White House and the Pentagon were delivered two or three days before that communicator. Go back and you can see it in the public. Uh, that, that, that was the, I don't think it was appreciated here at the time. It was not appreciated, but I don't think you heard there was a lot of hell of a lot of other things going on. But the Egyptian military was loud and clear. Now, it wasn't the only reason. I said it wasn't the only reason. I had their own reasons that I wanted to find out. But I think it reinforced their instinct that uh, it would be a mistake to use. Um, uh, the question from the blue collar worker. About uh, uh, the, the apparent contradiction between uh, military providing large amounts, huge amounts of military assistance uh, in order to support countries that have made peace. And I agree, it seems like a contradiction. Uh, but the essential uh, calculation, was, by the way, it started with the first. Second uh, disengagement agreement negotiated by Henry Kissinger, the first military assistance gave to Egypt. Um, it was a, a judgment that the United States made that both sides were taking risks for peace uh, in ways that would have the potential to undermine their security. And so, therefore, it made sense for the United States to provide tangible support for their security needs in order to facilitate their implementation of the peace treaty, which 
didn't get involved in significant uh, withdrawals. And it's security responsibility is taken on by the Egyptians. Now, I think that you could probably say that that calculation uh, was fulfilled within a few years of the intention of the peace So why did it continue? Well, uh, politics, by the way, politics. Essentially, uh, the commitment to Israel's security, which uh, has been there basically back to the 1960s, before the system, but, but has grown over time, particularly in the context of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, when Israel was taking this on. So the justification for providing uh, security systems to Israel, even when the Israeli economy got to the point where they couldn't even know economic systems, the economic systems were shifted over the military systems. As soon as that happened, President Mubarak said, I don't have the same deal. He goes, you need all that military assistance to Israel, then you've got to give military assistance to my military too. And so what started off as, as I think, uh, pretty much parity um, changed to this, this balance where uh, Egypt still gets some of it, it's not $250 million or something. Israel gets no Israel's military systems yeah, moved up more quickly than Egypt. Egypt is still in the problem by as much so that there's, there is now this disparity uh, which Israel gets at least $3 billion in military systems. So yeah, 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 yeah. And Egypt gets one of them three billion dollars. It means less than half. And finally, uh, the issue of the NGOs. Uh, uh, thank you for Even in the days when, when the United States practiced uh, this Arab exemption, uh, the United States government was still committed to building civil society, and uh, helping NGOs to be able to advocate on behalf of the interests Society, particularly with those parts of society that uh, uh, are unable to effectively advocate for themselves without assistance uh, from foreign engineers, is something that, that has been, always been important, uh, but particularly important in the context of uh, the rise of the democratic Egypt and the organizations that have been around here. Fighting work uh, with across the, the political spectrum, uh, helping uh, political parties organize, uh, get out the vote, reaching the basic democratic techniques. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think that uh, that is legitimate. Uh, I don't think it should be tarred as somehow foreign interference. Thank you all very much. Thank you.